1992, I graduated with a degree in environmental chemistry under my belt, and I promptly enrolled in law school because I was going to change the world. The future me would single-handedly be holding the chemical and pharmaceutical industries to account for their environmental record. And then we moved to Lincolnshire. <laughs> Little did I realise you couldn't change the world from Lincolnshire, at least you couldn't back in 1993. So I did what everyone did back then when you had no idea what to do with your life. I trained to be a teacher. <laughs> Turns out, though, once I had gotten over my abject terror of them, that teenagers were my thing. And in having had the privilege of spending 23 years both teaching and supporting them pastorally, I've learned a thing or two. I very quickly developed a professional mask, like many people do in many professions. Mask on, I was empathetic and resourceful and respectful. I was passionate and supportive and yet not to be messed with. I had a thousand different ways to explain esoteric chemical concepts. Mask off. Mm. Mask off. Mask off, I valiantly juggled my workload with my husband and the ballet runs and the usual household chores. To be honest, mask off, I was zombified most of the time, except, except when I mustered up just enough energy to play the martyr at home. Stress. Stress is a weird thing. It kind of creeps up on you. I spent 21 and a half years walking past the stress in the workplace poster that sat on the staff room notice board, thinking, actually, I didn't think, I knew. That was not for me. That was for lesser mortals. And then, boom, one day. One day, I was sat in my car, in the staff car park, first thing in the morning. I had already had a mini meltdown. Uh, the dog had vanished. I was running late. Mascara was streaming down my face. Uh, I had an assembly to run. Uh, the IT was going to let me down. The IT always let us down in our school. It was kind of like a running joke, but the type that had long since stopped being funny. And I sat in my car, and I stared at the dashboard, and I thought to myself, I don't know how to put my mask on today. I don't know how to keep it in place. Ends can also be beginnings, I have learnt. I began to read and to ask questions about stress and well-being, about diet and brain health. And as I dug deeper and deeper into the scientific research, I realised that inevitably I always ended up in the same place, regardless from where I had started. When you look up the word human in the dictionary, there are a whole range of definitions. They range from a bipedal primate mammal to a person, to a man, woman and child. I'm not sure why I was expecting it to be any more profound, but I'd like to offer my own definition. Human, a miracle of evolution. An ecosystem, a symbiotic relationship between tens of trillions of archaea and fungi and microbes, of phages and parasites, of viruses and a person. Because it turns out that genetically, I am less than 1% human. And this symbiotic relationship has been evolving for millions of years, indeed long before we were human. And yet, it's only in the past couple of decades that we've come to appreciate how intricately linked their well-being is to our own. And perhaps, fueling myself on obscene amounts of coffee and chocolate caramel digestives for the entire of my teaching career may not have been the ideal. 90% of the microbes, and I would like to uh, focus on microbes today, are resident in my gut, in my colon. There are some things that we've delegated to them directly, um, synthesis of vitamin B12, for example. But they also produce thousands of small molecules that are integral to the health of my immune system. They influence how I absorb energy from otherwise indigestible foods, how I store fat, how I manage my blood sugar levels. My gut microbes are critical for the functional development and the structure of my brain. And it turns out that it may be my gut microbes to explain how I react to stress. So where did these microbes come from? Well, our guts are colonized very rapidly at birth. 
And the species of strains of microbe that we all start life with depend on a number of factors, such as the method of delivery, whether we're breastfed or not, um, the environment, early use of antibiotics. One of their first roles is to start to educate our immune systems. They start to teach our immune system who are the good guys and who are the pathogens. There are 130 different prebiotic and indigestible fibres in breast milk. They are there only to feed our gut microbes, to give them and us the best start in life. Because throughout our lives, our gut microbes are busy chattering away to our brains. They're heavily invested in a conversation that's happening via the gut-brain axis. It's a hugely complex communication network, but essentially it links our gut to the emotional and cognitive centers of our brains. You'll be familiar with the expression, I've got butterflies in my stomach. Right now, I have got real butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> And uh, lucky me, that is effectively my microbiota gut-brain axis in full swing. It's communicating via my vagus nerve and a host of neurotransmitters that I am feeling acutely stressed. In fact, gut microbes regulate about 90% of the serotonin in my body. Serotonin is the neurotransmitter that's important for my mood, anxiety levels, overall happiness. Most antidepressant drugs on the market right now work to raise serotonin levels in the brain. I'd like to take a minute to talk about a really cool mouse experiment. Different strains of lab mouse have a gut microbiota that's specific to that strain, and they also exhibit recognizably different behaviors. NIH Swiss mice, for example, are known for their gregarious nature. Balb sea mice, on the other hand, are much more anxious and timid in their everyday behaviours. And this can be seen in the way that each strain of mouse routinely tackles mouse boot camp activities. Yep, mouse boot camp, that is a real thing. Um, for example, timing how long it takes for a mouse to step down off a raised platform, or exploiting a mouse's preference for dark, familiar, safe places with its inherent need to explore the bright and the unfamiliar. So researchers, to all intents and purposes, swapped the gut microbes from one strain of mouse into the other. Within three weeks, the mice had completely changed their behavior. The NIH Swiss mice, previously extrovert, lost their swagger, took three times as long to step down off the raised platform. So what can we conclude? Well, although we do need to be careful in making direct associations between what happens in mice and what happens in humans, changing the mice's gut microbes effectively changed the nature of the conversation that was happening via their gut-brain axis. And their brains responded by radically altering their behavior and their personality. This is huge. Our gut microbes have a profound influence on how we react and to interact with the world around us. Now, although we have yet to define exactly what constitutes um, a healthy microbiota, we do see significant differences between the gut microbes of major depressive disorder patients, for example, as compared with the general population, including a correlation between severity of depression and specific strains of microbe. Now, whether this is cause or effect, we're not entirely sure. But when researchers took gut microbes from major depressive patients and put them into germ-free mice who'd grown up in a sterile bubble, the mice began to exhibit depressive-like behaviors. So, my mental health, it's also influenced hugely by my immune system. And of the thousands of small molecules that my gut microbes are producing, short-chain fatty acids are turning out to be a key piece in this particular puzzle. Because these small molecules are the energy source for the cells lining my gut. But more importantly, they signal to my gut to knit tightly together to stop pathogenic bits and pieces leaking out of my gut and setting up a chronic 
um, inflammation response, a chronic immune response in my gut locally, but also in my brain. This knock-on effect is seen in almost all cognition-related diseases, from anxiety and depression through to dementia. So it will come as no surprise to learn that most gastrointestinal diseases, such as irritable bowel syndrome, go hand in hand with an elevated stress response, anxiety, depression, an altered gut microbiota, and a leaky gut. I believe that the conversation we've been having about diet and health, whether primarily concerned about obesity or type 2 diabetes, autoimmune diseases, or a host of other 21st century illnesses whose prevalence has risen so dramatically over the past 40 years, I believe that conversation has completely missed the point. The conversation around diet and mental health has been pretty much non-existent. Because I don't believe it's important whether you're vegetarian or not, whether you prescribe to the latest obsession with high-protein, low-carb diets. What we should be thinking about is what we're feeding our microbes. Because when you get that right, everything else kind of falls into place, including an improved resilience to the stress and anxiety of modern life. So what should we be eating to encourage a plentiful, diverse gut microbiota? The answer are Big Macs, as in microbe accessible carbohydrates, <laughs> which are carbohydrates that have not been broken down or absorbed by our body, so they reach the gut intact, ready to be fermented by our microbes. We are talking soluble fibre such as psyllium husk, fermentable fibres such as inulin, pectone, fructo-oligosaccharides, uh, resistant starches, all of which are known to be favoured by the types of microbe that produce these short-chain fatty acids. And, coincidentally, they lower the pH of our gut, which aids absorption of key minerals like iron, magnesium, and calcium. Now, I appreciate that's not really how supermarkets label their produce. What we're looking at, really, is a plant-rich diet, one that incorporates plenty of artichokes, onions, garlic, um, whole grain wheat and rye, pulses, lentils, apples, carrots. While we're drawing up our shopping list, we should add in some omega-3 rich oils, fish, and plenty of red wine and dark chocolate for the polyphenols. <laughs> Last but not least, fermented probiotic foods. So I'm talking about kefir milk, yogurt, cheese, miso, sauerkraut, kimchi. You may be starting to suspect that what I'm advocating here is a traditional Mediterranean or Asian-style diet. And there is plenty of evidence that links such diets to improve mental health. Conversely, the traditional, typical Western-style diet that's high in saturated fats, free sugars, red meat processed foods, is definitively associated with poorer mental health and an improved um, and increased probability of depression. All of which got me thinking, who has a worse diet than stressed out teachers living off uh, coffee and chocolate caramel digestives? A couple of years into my teaching career, one of my most conscientious students walked into a lesson after about 20 minutes and said, sorry I'm late, miss, my strawberry Pop-Tart set fire to the kitchen curtains. I googled the nutritional content of a frosted strawberry Pop-Tart. I had no idea it was still a breakfast choice for the uh, modern teenager. One Pop-Tart gives you 13% of your saturated fats and 18% of your sugar for the day. Let me put that in perspective. The latest available data from the UK um, National Diet and Nutrition Survey reported that teenagers get 14% of their calories from sugar on average. The daily recommendation is for less than 5%. Mice fed a high sugar diet showed a significant decline in their ability to adapt to changing situations, and it negatively impacted both their short and their long-term memory. Both changes associated with a change in gut microbiota. Teenagers um, 
consume about half the recommended daily amount of fibre. 11% of teenagers do not eat fruit or vegetables on a daily basis. Another survey, 2013, 10,000 12 to 16 year olds living in Exeter. This survey reported that 17% ate junk food on a daily basis. Junk food comes under the umbrella of ultra-processed foods. This is my favourite definition of an ultra-processed food. I think it conjures up a really nice image. I used to call it calorie-dense, nutritionally bankrupt food. But I think we can no longer deny the fact that the Western diet, ultra-processed foods, are actively causing us harm. I wonder if teenagers in particular are uh, trapped in a perfect storm. Academic pressure, social stresses, uncertain futures, and most importantly to my mind, and that of their gut microbes, a shocking diet. All of which are contributing to this worrying rise in self-harm, anxiety and depression amongst this age group. Let alone setting them up for a substantially increased risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, or some other 21st century illness. I don't profess to have all the answers. This field of nutritional psychiatry is in its infancy. But I do know the question we should be asking ourselves is not, what do I fancy for tea? But rather, what were my microbes fancy for tea? The results can be life-changing. Thank you.